4, or segment 4 in our ongoing series on economics. We had left off with the Federal Reserve banknotes of 1950 series vintage, where they had shrunk the print, hope that's a proper word, shrunk, reduced, let's try that. <laughs> they had reduced the size of the print to the left of the portrait, uh, perhaps trying to save ink, either that or to keep us from reading the fine print on the note. In fact, it has indeed become fine print. One of the reasons they may have done this was because five years prior to the 1950 uh, initial issuance of these notes, Congress had authorized the Federal Reserve to reduce their backing requirements. You remember they used to have a 40% backing requirement. In 1945, according to I Bet You Thought, and if you're like me, you probably thought a lot of things about banking. It's amazing what the Federal Reserve will tell you about their own scam or scheme. It says here, by the 1940s, this is page 29, Congress slashed the gold requirement to 25%. And in 1968, eliminated gold backing entirely. If this particular instrument was only backed with 25% gold, although you couldn't get the gold. It really becomes uh, academic. If you can't get it, you might just well not have any backing at all. Then it only requires two and a half dollars of the money to issue a $10 note. That's getting to be a very profitable operation. It used to cost $4 to issue a $10 note. I'd like to be able to get $10 notes for $4, wouldn't you? But later on in 1945, Congress was authorized to issue $10 notes, and it only cost them $2 and a half. The print was reduced. You notice we're back to the first district, the Boston Fed, first district. In fact, you notice the little letter A, which precedes the serial number. That also indicates that this is a Boston Fed or first district note. This is one of the ways they keep track of the notes, by the way. Let's suppose someone rolled an armored car over in uh, the Boston area, and they chose to go out to the San Francisco area to start spending their wad. Uh, the Fed would be on the lookout for first district notes out in the 12th district. And if you passed around an awful lot of these things out of the first district, the odds would be pretty good that you were the, you were the culprit. They can also, I guess, monitor some economic... Uh, movements in the economy by seeing where the notes wind up or how they circulate. I'm sure it's pretty crude compared to how they keep track of checks and other types of instruments. This, however, was all a prelude to what was ultimately done in 1963. Now, please excuse me. This happens to be a 1977 series note. When we were shooting the photographs of these notes, I didn't happen to have a 1963 note in my possession. But the day after John Fitzgerald Kennedy was assassinated, according to uh, Des Griffin's book, Fourth Rank of the Rich, I believe it was, the Federal Reserve began issuing its first no-promise notes. We were all busy watching the electronic campfire. And when you pull off a ploy like this, you need some sort of a diversion. And an assassination of a very popular president was certainly a good diversion. I'm not suggesting that it was planned. I'm just suggesting that it was a very convenient coincidence. Federal Reserve note, the United States of America. Oops, de doo we've got a little line missing. Will pay to the bear on demand has somehow disappeared. I guess they're trying to save some more ink. And it now says that it is $10. $10 of what? Lawful money? To the left of portrait, you notice that they've gone back to large print. This note is legal tender for all that's public and private. And that's the end of the sentence. This promise to pay money is a formalistic offer, but it's not an offer to pay the money any longer. In 1968, gold redemption was dropped altogether. Well, you say, well, we still had silver. But the silver was taken out of the coins in 1965. In fact, they were planning to take the silver out of the coins. We were certain that they knew in advance that they were going to do it because the 1957 
silver certificate is the last series of the silver certificate. So the silver certificates were issued by the United States Treasury, and we'll be getting to those in a subsequent lesson, were terminated as of 1957 and subsequent years, but that was the last series. In 1963, the promise to redeem Federal Reserve notes was removed. In 1965, the silver was taken out of the coins, and June 24, 1968, was the deadline for redemption of all outstanding promissory notes that were supposed to be redeemable in silver. So, yes, Virginia, if you have a silver certificate, it's redeemable in another piece of paper with the same denomination. But the United States Treasury nor the Federal Reserve will give you any silver at par for those instruments. And if the instrument will not pay at par, in other words, 10 for 10 or 1 for 1 or 50 for 50, dollar weight for dollar denomination, then the tender has been abandoned, and an abandoned tender cannot be a legal tender. You know, for example, that when you write a check for $100, if you only have $99.99 in the account, that check is a bad check. It will not clear because it is not payable at par. If this instrument here will not buy a $10 weight of silver, from the issuer of this instrument, in other words, the Federal Reserve has got to give you a $10 weight of silver, which is 4,125 grains of 90% pure silver, or a $10 weight of gold, which would be 258 grains. If they will not give you that for that instrument, then the tender has been abandoned, and an abandoned tender cannot be a legal tender. Anyway, the hoax is pretty well established. Let's ask ourselves some logical questions. Supposing we were issuing Federal Reserve notes ourselves, how much would it cost us to issue an honest $10 note, if you can have such a thing as an honest $10 note? Well, it would have to cost you $10 of the gold or the silver, plus it would cost you a fee for printing the note. What if the instrument will not pay gold or silver? How much would it cost to print the note or issue the note then? Well, many people will say that it'll cost a cent or a fraction of a cent or two cents or three cents. I don't know what the figure will be. Let's start by asking the United States Treasury how much it costs to issue a note, such as a $10 bill or a one or a hundred or whatever denomination it might be. Let's back up here and look at some ones and a hundred. This little brochure we have is called uh, the dollar of the future. That's like saying the inch or the ounce or the gallon of the future. Dollar is a unit of measure. It's not a thing. Yet they're suggesting, for example, that the Susan B. Anthony coin is a dollar. That's not a dollar, and it's not an ounce, and it's not an inch, and it's not a pound. Nor did it weigh a dollar. It was only made out of copper and nickel, and is a very cheap coin. It says here, the $1 bill costs nearly two cents to produce. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's say it costs a full two cents, of what I'm not sure, to print or issue a $1 bill. How many cents of your labor must you give up to get a $1 bill? 100? Now I have a question for you. If you have to give up 100 cents of your labor to get a piece of paper that the Treasury admits they get for two cents, who gets the other 98 cents? You should be able to think that one out pretty quickly. If you came into my sandwich shop that I had back in Maine some years ago, and I sold you a sandwich for 100 cents, and as you were walking out the door, I said, Psst, confidentially, I got that sandwich for two cents. Who got the other 98 cents? You could see then how it would be that I could take long vacations in the Bahamas, couldn't you? Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. It costs two cents to print a $1 bill. What's the profit margin to the United States Treasury or the Federal Reserve? Well, it would have to be 98%, which isn't a bad profit. If it costs two cents to print a $1 bill, how much would it cost to print a $100 bill? 
being as how neither one of these pieces of paper will pay a substance that's on deposit, because there is no substance on deposit. Well, it's obvious it only costs two cents then to print a $100 bill. Counterfeiters know this, don't they? They don't waste their time printing ones, twos, fives, tens, and twenties. They print hundreds. They're just as cheap. There's no more paper, ink, or labor in a $100 bill than there is in a one. Now, if it costs two cents to print a one, and it costs two cents to print a 100, what would be the mark up on a $100 bill? I believe it would be 500,000 percent. Jewelers don't even do that well. If you made 500,000 percent markup on your products that you put into the marketplace, would you be worried about balancing your budget? Congress operates on a balanced budget. The federal government has operated on a balanced budget at least since 1965, and you didn't hear that first from Barbara Walters. Monetarily speaking, the federal government collects no money and spends no money. Zero money in, zero money out is a balanced budget. And the federal government has been operating on a balanced budget since 1965. Now, Congress feigns a concern about deficit spending. Have you ever tried to spend a deficit? Have you ever seen one? If we used gold as money, we could spend it. If we use clocks as money, we could spend them, because spend implies to deliver or to pay out. If we're spending deficits, that means that we are coining deficits into money and we're spending them. What is a deficit by definition? It's a sum of money due or rather, I shouldn't say it's a, a sum of money due, it's a sum of money that you've spent that you don't have. So it's a form of a sum of money due. It's a deficiency of amount. How do you spend a deficiency of amount? How do you receive three gold coins of one ounce each and spend four gold coins of one ounce each when you only receive three? Well, deficit spenders must somehow be able to tell us how this is done. Because when you spend a deficit, you spend what you don't have. That's pretty tricky. We asked one of our congressmen a few years ago to help define what this deficit substance is, because someday we may run out of deficits, and when we do, we're going to be broke. And I wanted to know where the end of the barrel was going to be. And you know, he wouldn't answer Does it really cost two cents to print a $1 bill or a $100 bill? If you think it does, then you identify what it costs two cents of to print a $100 bill, and I will give you 100 pounds of that substance absolutely free. You see, folks, it doesn't really cost anything, monetarily speaking, to issue an instrument that will never pay any money. Why? would the United States Treasury or the Federal Reserve pay two cents of copper to get a piece of paper that could acquire much, much copper? Why would you use corn to purchase corn? Why would you use wheat to purchase wheat? Why would you use copper even to acquire the copper coins? Because they say here in the dollar of the future that, quote, each new Anthony dollar costs only three cents to produce. What they're saying is that each 100 cents costs three cents. Well, if three cents measured copper, why would they pay three cents of copper to get enough copper back to manufacture a coin that was only copper that they would stamp the number 100 cents or one dollar on? Why would you pay three ears of corn to get three ears of corn you already have the coin. What I'm suggesting is that the Treasury merely writes a number on a piece of paper called a government check, and they steal the copper and the nickel with which to make the Susan B. Anthony coins, and they steal the paper and the ink and the labor and the machines to print those notes. Now, a few years ago, the United States Treasury had acquired some new printing presses. The presses cost about $3 million apiece. 
being a very concerned citizen that I was, I wrote to the Treasury and I wanted to know what it was they paid $3 million off to purchase the new machines. I didn't get a very substantial reply. I wrote again. And then I wrote a third time. The third time I got a telephone call from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing from a Mr. Robert Stevens. He told me that he was the person who was responsible for saving the American taxpayers thousands and thousands of dollars. I was delighted, as you can well imagine. I said, what did you save us thousands of dollars off? For that matter, what did you use $3 million off to purchase the new machines? Did you pay $3 million of gold? And he said, no. Did you use $3 million of silver? And he said, no. Did you use $3 million of copper and nickel? And he said, no. Well, pray tell, what did you use to purchase the machines? He says, we bought them with Federal Reserve notes, I guess. Sir, you printed those on your old machines. Long silence. Can you imagine you, the viewer, and myself in cahoots running a little printing press operation, and we're printing $100 bills, and we're just running off the old press, and pretty soon we run out of ink. And you begin to moan and bewail the fact that you're going to have to go back to be a farmer or a machinist or whatever you might be. Gosh, we have to work for a living now. We're out of ink. And I smile paternalistically and I say, go downtown and get us some more ink. To which you respond, well, with what am I going to acquire the ink? And I hand you some of my crisp $100 bills that we just printed. Oh, I see. What does it cost to acquire the ink? Monetarily speaking, nothing. Labor-wise, it takes a little bit of your time and energy to go downtown to find someone who will give you some ink for one of your bogus $100 bills. Monetarily speaking, it costs nothing to get ink. A little while later, we're printing, and pretty soon we run out of paper, and you say, oh, this is terrible. We're going to have to go back to work. And I smile again. And you recognize that paternalistic smile. And you say, aha, I'll go down and I'll get some more paper. And with what will you acquire the paper? Why, some of our notes that we've just acquired. What does it cost? Monetarily speaking, you get the paper for nothing. Pretty soon, the machine is wearing down, and it's beginning to clatter and shake. And the bills aren't coming out as crisp as they once were. They're not very legible. Now the machine is going to be very expensive. And you say, this is terrible. Why, well, we're going to have to go back to... No. I said, no, go get me a machine. And you smile, oh, yes, and you grab a fistful of $100 bills. And I said, no, write them a check. They certainly know that our checks are good because they've been taking our notes for years. But if they insist on notes, we'll gladly give them notes. A check is a, an order telling someone else to pay, and a note is a promise to pay. And a check payable in notes is a void instrument. You still haven't been paid. So we're going to get the machine for absolutely nothing. Either with a check or with a note, it makes no difference. But checks are much more convenient, aren't they? It doesn't cost a cent or a fraction of a cent of anything to print a Federal Reserve note, which means that the first party of these instruments, which is the Federal Reserve and the United States Treasury, because they're both in cahoots, the first party gets these things for nothing. Lord Acton, the British historian, had told us that power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. To which Karl Marx would probably agree. Absolutely. If you were able to get Federal Reserve notes for no monetary cost, how many would you print? Would you just print how many you need today? Or would you print a few extras for a rainy day? The National Debt, Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, tells us on page 8, quote, The federal government, with the cooperation of the Federal Reserve, has the inherent power to create money, hyphen, almost any amount of it, end quote. If you had the power to create money, why would you need mine? If the federal government and the Federal Reserve have the power to create money, why do they tax the public? We'll get to that in a little while. I wrote to Internal Revenue, in fact. I always have questions of my public officials. 
And I wanted to know, if you people can create money, why do you need mine? If indeed this is money, and I know it's not, but you say it is, and you want me to believe it is, why do you need money? And if you have the power to create money, almost any amount of it, is there anyone you can't buy? Amos Bruce, a taxi cab driver of St. Louis a few years ago, had written to the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, and he had a question. It says in your book, he says, that uh, you have the power to create money, almost any amount of it. What's the limiting factor? Why can't you create any amount of it? And they wrote back to him and they told him that there were two things that limited how much they could create. Number one, the speed of the presses. And number two, the rate at which the public will accept it. Now, by accepting it, I don't think they mean by standing in line and receiving it by the basketful. I think what they meant was, were you willing to work for what we get for nothing? Because when the American public ever discovers and understands and then believes in this fraud, the American public will no longer labor for a piece of paper with a number on it. And the game will be all over. Since July 4th of 1984, my wife and myself have refused to labor for Federal Reserve notes. We believe that this is a fraud. And don't think that you're going to acquire our materials from us using Federal Reserve notes or any other bank instruments. We don't accept them. And we haven't since July 4th, our day of independence, 1984. So now... The federal government and the Federal Reserve have the power to create money. Now, this isn't money. These are only promises to pay money with a promise taken off. And they're calling them money. So there's a misnomer again. You have to be very careful with these people. They tell you the truth, but they also tell a few fibs. And maybe they just don't understand the issue. How many would they print? How many would you print if you got them for nothing? Bureau of Engraving and Printing? This is the United States Treasury seal. This is their little brochure, and it's called... Production of government securities. Uh, in the world of finance, what's a security? Do you know? It's an IOU. Treasury bonds, treasury bills, and notes. All of those are IOUs. And IOUs are called securities. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine my telling somebody that, hey, I just bought some securities today. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I bought some IOUs from uh, Paul Johnson. <laughs> you must be kidding. If you acquired his house, that would be an asset. That would be a security. To buy an IOU for something, I would say that that was an insecurity. But the government calls them securities, and that's another play on words. It tells us on page two, quote, The principal product of the Bureau is United States paper currency, averaging approximately 16 million notes a day. End quote. Isn't that marvelous? 16 million notes a day, and they operate seven days a week, and it makes no difference if they're printing ones or if they're printing 100s. And they get them for nothing. But Federal Reserve notes only account for 21% of what people call money. 3%, according to the story of money, a little comic book put out by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. This one here, I think, is... No, oh, this is a 1980 issue. 1980 issue on the inside cover. They tell us that we have coin, $12.5 billion in face value coin, $122 billion in face value paper currency, and $280 billion in face value of checks. <laughs> Gosh, if everybody tried to convert all the checks into Federal Reserve notes, they'd be short, wouldn't they? They'd be about $158 billion short, or somewhere in that order. In other words, there aren't even enough Federal Reserve notes to support all the checks that you people are writing. Why? because most checks aren't converted into notes. And once they figured out that you weren't converting checks into notes, they figured, well, we don't need very many notes. So we're only printing 16 million notes a day, seven days a week. And of course, some of that is to replace the worn out notes. But we're not wearing them out that fast. Coin, $12.5 billion in coin. How valuable is the coin? Not very valuable at all. Modern Money Mechanics, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, tells us on page 3, quote, Coins do have some intrinsic value as metal, but far less than their face amount. How much less? 
Remember what they told us here in this treasury brochure, dollar of the future? Each new Anthony dollar costs only three cents to produce. So the coin is only worth about 3% of its declared face value. That's a pretty cheap coin. So when the Federal Reserve says the coins do have some intrinsic value as metal, but far less than their face amount, they're not kidding. 3%? That's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? How much does it cost then to issue Federal Reserve notes? Monetarily speaking, nothing. How much can you acquire? How much political power, economic power, and religious power could you amass to yourself if you had the power to issue Federal Reserve notes? Do you think it's any wonder that elections in America are pretty well ordained, that certain people win, and it doesn't make any difference which party it is that represents who? It doesn't make any difference if in 1980 we have a George Bush running on a Republican ticket who's a member of the Trilateral Commission, or if we have Jimmy Carter who's running as a Democrat, or if in, on the independent ticket we have a fellow by the name of Anderson. All three of them were members of the Trilateral Commission. And the Trilateral Commission, which meets in New York, which was established in 1973 with Jimmy Carter as a co-founder, has as a perpetual member the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Mr. Paul Volcker. And when you have the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank who belongs to your little club and you wanted to make some investments and you didn't know if whether or not as chairman of the Coca-Cola Corporation you ought to go out and buy Minute Maid now or if you should wait until the value of their stock was lower, you might go and ask Mr. Volcker, what do you think we ought to do? And he might say, well, we're going to vote tight money beginning next week. If I were you, I would wait until we have issued our decree because the decrees reach the public 30 days after the Fed has made its decision. That way the insiders have at least a one-month lead on everybody else. The Federal Reserve tells you they're going to give you a 30-day lead in a little publication called I Bet You Thought. Federal Open Market Committee decisions, page 22, aren't secret. Huh. A summary of the deliberation and record of policy actions are made public about 30 days after each meeting. That means they get one month so advance action on the stock market before the public ever figures out what the Federal Open Market Committee did. And the Federal Open Market Committee is attached to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and the New York Fed is the central bank of the 12. The other 11 Federal Reserve Banks clear checks and they print books and tell you what a wonderful job they're doing of managing our economy. What does all this have to do with politics and tyranny? A great deal. You remember we spoke of the Communist Manifesto a little bit earlier. The Communist Manifesto tells us, my particular book here, it appears on page 104, fifth plank, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. Centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. Do we have a monopoly? Sure. If you start printing notes that look like this, you'll go to jail for illegal counterfeiting. The Federal Reserve is the only outfit that can counterfeit government securities, and yet Congress has been given the power to punish counterfeiters of government securities. Do they punish the counterfeiters, or do they give them the presses and the paper and the ink? They're in it together. The Federal Reserve Bank is the central bank of the United States. Who says? Every one of the Federal Reserve Banks will tell you that in almost every one of their publications. Your money in the Federal Reserve System on page 9 tells us, quote, since 1913 the Federal Reserve System has functioned as the central bank of the United States. The central bank is the fifth plank of the Communist Manifesto. This is confirmed by Fed points. Fed points is put out by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Quote, the Federal Reserve System is the central banking system of the United States. Confirmed by the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank, which asks or tells us who we are and what we do. Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, page 3. The United States has a central bank. Our central bank was established in 1913. It's the Federal Reserve. 
So there's the fifth plank of the Communist Manifesto, which was passed and enacted the same year we got the second plank of the Communist Manifesto, which is a progressive or graduated income tax. The central bank controls the credit. All of these instruments are credit instruments because they do not represent a quantity of money on deposit. Even if they did, they'd still be the deferment of the payment of the money. Now they represent a quantity of something else that's on deposit. Well, what would that be? Modern Money Mechanics, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, tells you what you have on deposit in your local bank if you happen to be one of the uh, individuals who has a deposit. Now, deposits in local banks are either demand deposits or time deposits. Your checking account is called a demand deposit because you can demand the deposit withdrawn and spend it in an instant. A time deposit, if you check your savings account books, will oftentimes have a 30-day requirement where they could hold you up for 30 days before you can close out the account. Check the fine print in your savings account book. They don't have to give you a savings account when you demand it. They can make you wait 30 days. In fact, maybe they can make you wait longer now. I don't know. I haven't checked banking regulations of late. What are deposits, however? Page 3, Chicago Fed. Quote, deposits are merely book entries. Period. Deposits are not gold, they're not silver, they're not copper, and they're not paper. You recall that the Federal Reserve had told us in a little publication called Keeping Our Money Healthy, page 12, and you recall the Federal Reserve System works only with credit. Bookkeeping entries are credit. And if you tried to rob a bank, the only way you could actually rob a local bank is if you went down there and you stole their ledger books, tore out the pages, and went around trying to spend the ledger entries. But the merchants of town would laugh you to scorn. <laughs> They'd say, that's just a piece of paper with numbers on it. That's right, and that's all these are. Federal Reserve notes are the instruments by which you transfer the ledger entries between banks. The money itself stays on deposit in the bank. It doesn't exist, but it's merely a book entry. The money never leaves the banking system. The New York Fed confirms this in I Bet You Thought on page 7. Most people, you see, when they go to the bank to cash a check, they believe that a Federal Reserve note is the cash that you get in return for the check. Federal Reserve notes are not cash. Nor is there any cash kept in your account at a bank. Page 7, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, I bet you thought, quote, Banks don't keep cash in checking accounts. They don't. Banks don't keep cash in checking accounts and don't transfer currency or coin when acting on a check's instructions. Checkbook balances are transferred between accounts as bookkeeping entries only, period. Now, if you happen to have attended some of the fundamentalist type uh, churches, as I did a few years ago, you may have heard it preached even from the pulpits that we're heading for a cashless society. Wrong. The United States entered a cashless society, 100% cashless, in 1965. Federal Reserve notes aren't cash. They never were. They were only a promise to pay the cash. Now they don't promise to pay you anything. We are on a cashless society basis now. And if they change us from the Federal Reserve notes to debit cards, Substantively, there will be no change in the system. We still won't be using anything as money. We'll just be using numbers of absolutely nothing on deposit. But they'll be able to keep track of what you do a little better. Whereas with Federal Reserve notes, your use of monetized credit and debt is somewhat difficult to trace. When you use debit cards, credit cards, and checks, your transactions are all on file. In fact, a friend of mine uh, was living in South Africa for a short while, several years, and he was being interrogated by police as to where he was on a particular day. And he said, well, I was up in Europe visiting my relatives. And he said, no, you weren't. Kind of makes you wonder why they asked the question. They already knew the answer. And they produced a spreadsheet, and they said you were at the uh, Montreal Hilton at the Montreal airport. You checked in on such and such a day, and you checked out on such and such a day. 
I'm not so certain that they didn't even know when he ate his meals at this particular motel and how much the meals cost and perhaps even what he had for each meal. My friend asked me, how did they know? Well, I said, what did you use as an instrument with which to acquire your motel room? Did you use Fed notes or Canadian notes or something like that? Or did you use checks or, he says, I used a visa card. Well, that's how they know. Because when you use visa cards and checks, all of that information is compiled by your bank. Your bank then forwards that information on, apparently, to your district. And somehow that information finds its way to the big computer building over there in Brussels. So all the economic transactions that are conducted on the face of the globe by people who are using negotiable instruments such as checks and credit cards is available not only to your police, but to Interpol and I suppose even the KGB. The wonderful system. The purpose of credit, or the credit system, is to acquire what you produce now and pay you later. This is a credit instrument. And the idea is that I would promise to pay you later. Or if I can get you to believe that this is the payment, I can get what you produce now and pay you never. Then if I can get you to stop using my notes and start using the checks that my system employs, I can keep track of where you spend what it is you think you're spending. Because the money you're spending doesn't exist. Oh, I forgot to tell you that. Federal Reserve notes are not redeemable in anything. But to simply say that we're not using anything as money is very harsh. So the Federal Reserve has found a more coy way to tell us that we're using bogus notes. They tell us here, for example, in I Bet You Thought, page 27, banks create money by monetizing the private debts of businesses, individuals, and governments. That is, they create amounts of money against the value of those IOUs." End quote. Let me explain that. Banks create money by monetizing. The word monetize here is in quotation marks, which means they're not quite so sure that you can do this because the word monetize means, by definition, to coin or fashion into money. What we coin or fashion into money, people, is your debt. What is debt? I've never seen any debt ore, and if you took some debt ore to the treasury, could they refine it and then turn it into a nice pure coin? There's no such thing as debt as a substance. You cannot see, smell, hear, taste, and or touch debt either. What is debt by definition? Black's Law Dictionary, 5th edition, will cite State versus Doucet. Debt is, quote, a sum of money due. What you're using as money, which is represented by the quantity symbols in the corners of the bills, if you're using a $100 bill, you're passing a note which is payable in $100 of monetized debt. In other words, that's $100 of the money that's due. The money that you're spending is the money you don't have. It's the money you never received because the banks never had to put it into circulation. The reason they didn't have to put it into circulation is because we never demanded that they do so. They get the numbers for nothing, and many of the people out on the street don't. Now, if you're a person who gets the numbers for nothing, then you shouldn't be watching this video. In fact, I doubt you are watching this video. The use of a credit system and the employment of a credit system entails the dissemination of a lot of information. You remember, for example, that electronic money and the payments mechanism had told us, Boston Fed, that advances in computer and communications technology are paving the way for major changes in banking practices, many of them based upon the premise that money is information. The credit system is that system which passes information. It doesn't pass money. Suppose, for example, I wanted to purchase again this video camera that we're using for this particular series, and I wanted to purchase it, purchase it from uh, Paul Johnson. I said, Paul, how much do you want for that camera? He says, I'd like to have one ounce of gold. Triple nine, fine. Like a crew grand coin. Oh, okay. I give him the gold coin, and he gives me the camera. I think I got a pretty good deal. Like, I think he'll acknowledge that I got a pretty good deal at today's, at today's rates.
which are set by the Rothschilds, by the way, in uh, uh, London. Uh, that's official. The Rothschilds get together and they decide how much gold is worth. Huh. And how do they price it? They price it in their IOUs. And they do it every day. Boy, what a system. If I give him a piece of gold and he gives me the camera, how much information has passed hands? Very little. He might know my name and I might know his name. It's really immaterial if he knew my name or I knew his. All he told me was that he wants a piece of gold that weighs an ounce, and I give it to him, and I got the camera. But now, supposing I wanted to get the camera with my visa card, and I come into Paul and say, Paul, I have to have the camera, and here's my visa card. And let's suppose that Paul was a merchant, and he was selling cameras. Well, he says, uh, we'll just do our little imprint of your little visa card here, and we need to know your name and your address and so forth and so on. And your telephone number, why do you need that? Well, just in case, you know, if you don't pay, we, we might need to call on you. Oh. Is there any other information that has passed hands in this transaction? Well, yes. Because, you see, in order to get the visa card, I had to fill out an application form with my friendly bank. And I had to tell them who I was, where I lived, how much I earned, what my Social Security number was, how many jobs I've had in the past, I had to list some credit references and all the loans that I have outstanding, how many payments I have to go, and so forth and so on. I mean, that's just really incredible. So there's a lot of information that passes from hand to hand, and the information is necessary in order to regulate the people who are in debt, because a person who is using a credit card is a debtor, and he must be regulated by the granting party, and the granting party needs the information by which to regulate all the debtors. Remember, King Solomon said that the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is the servant or the slave, in some translations, to the lender. I have a question. Sure. If the Fed is as crooked as it sounds, why are they putting out dozens of these publications basically telling you how crooked they are? The cameraman has just come out with a question. I could just tell that he couldn't wait to ask this question. Uh, I kind of came as a shock. I don't know if it's showed on my face or not. I'm not used to having a camera and asking me a question. Most people who read these booklets are going to be students, either in the elementary school level, some of them are going to be a high school level, and some of them are going to be a college level. I'm fully convinced that the people who write these books honestly believe that they're doing the public a service. And I'm fully convinced that the people who are going to study these booklets in school are not going to be under be able to understand what they've just read. See, the American public is very, uh, well, it's educated to the point that it can read and formulate and pronounce the words. But we don't understand what we read. When we pick up a publication, for example, that tells us that banks only pretend to make loans or they loan promises to pay, I sincerely doubt that there are many people who think much of that. When they tell you on page three that the actual process of money creation takes place in commercial banks, I doubt anybody gives that any thought, that to create money doesn't cost anything, and that to earn it does. So they can continue to write their booklets and tell us how they manage the economy. In fact, there's a little picture on the back of this. I don't know if you can see it or zoom in on it by Mr. Cameraman who just asked the question. But you see, we have a money doctor. I don't know how that... Does that show up fairly well on the screen? It does. We have a money doctor. Now, this is the Federal Reserve agent. And you notice all of us happy individuals who are working the economy. This is a giant Rube Goldberg machine. And we're just... This is sort of a, a create work type project that the government is so prone to do. And one guy turns one gear one way and somebody else turns one another way and somebody oils and the thing doesn't accomplish anything. But this fellow up here is the Federal Reserve agent and he's regulating and managing the economy. Here's the money doctor on the front cover. You see he has a little stethoscope. And he's checking to make sure that everything is sound and secure and safe. These people honestly believe, apparently, that they are somehow endowed with some spiritual insight or intellectual insight to be able to regulate the remainder of the population called the non-bank public. And I think when you get that headstrong in this particular area, it's very difficult. Uh, for example, I had a discussion with a banker down in the Bahamas several years ago. His name was Reuben Fox. 
a rather nice chap. He worked for 12 years for Chase Manhattan Bank, one year of which he worked in the foreign exchange in New York. I spent probably 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, talking with him, and I finally got through to him that we were not using anything as money. And you could see it dawn on his face. He says, my God, all we did in the foreign exchange was add and subtract numbers of absolutely nothing. It hit him. But you see, he didn't know that until that discussion, and yet he worked for the Chase Manhattan Bank for 12 years. Bankers don't understand. In fact, I talked with a banker from the uh, Merrill Trust Bank. He was a manager of the Merrill Trust Bank back in Eastport, Maine. Didn't even know the Federal Reserve was a private corporation. Came into our store and he says, the Federal Reserve is the federal government, isn't it? I said, no. It's a private corporation. They tell you that in their own booklets. I bet you thought page 21 tells you it's a private corporation. You can look it up in telephone directory and find it listed under F, right alongside uh, Frank's uh, dry cleaner. It's a private company. They have incorporation seals. If I can find one here in the back of... There's one. There's an incorporation seal on the back of one of the little booklets. The Federal Reserve Bank of Boston was incorporated May 18, 1914. Who incorporated? The government. They pay postage. If you write to any one of the Federal Reserve Banks and order any of these publications that we have been using during this series, these publications are available at no charge. You can order as many as 25 copies of some of these publications, and they'll send them to you by the box load. The postage will be, you know, seven, eight, ten bucks. Don't worry about the postage. They'll use a Pitney Bowes postage meter, which suggests that the Federal Reserve is paying for the postage. If you can tell me what the postage is that the Federal Reserve is paying, that's expressed in dollars and cents, I'll give you a hundred pounds of that money absolutely free. Their buildings are elaborate. Multi-million dollar facilities. Some of them go five stories underground. Have massive underground parking facilities. Hundreds of cars that they can park under their own buildings. They have their own cafeterias. What did they pay for their buildings with? If you were the Federal Reserve and you could issue Federal Reserve notes and you could get them for nothing, why would you pay anything to get a beautiful Federal Reserve Bank, the likes of which they have, say, in St. Louis, Kansas City, San Francisco, Boston, New York, Richmond, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Atlanta. They've got some beautiful places. And they have some rather splendid-looking art. <laughs> this is just swaying steel. I think it's supposed to simulate giant uh, Federal Reserve notes just swaying in the breeze. I don't know whose idea of art this is, but uh, that stands outside a Federal Reserve Bank building in Richmond. They can't even show you any more than just a tiny portion of the building. It's a massive building. They get those buildings for nothing. And they get the labor of the Federal Reserve employees for nothing as well. So cr the credit system is used to collect information, information about the individual citizens. That information, of course, is then available to be analyzed, and then it's used to formulate policy to control the people whose information you've just collected and so on. Uh, we'll be discussing that in a subsequent lesson. I think what we'll do at this point in time, I think we'll take a break and we'll pick up with uh, lesson number five. I thank you for joining us. I hope that uh, this has been instructional. Look forward to seeing you again in lesson number five. Please join us. Thank you.